Greetings, I'm Salvador Cordova. Welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday night. This is uh, uh, this shows a different format, and I'm trying it out. I'm calling it um, just the random thoughts because there's many times that I uh, just feel like just offering random thoughts, and um, some of the the thoughts aren't very long. And not quite enough to fill out a show, and some some parts are just way, way too long, but uh, kind of cut them down. And I had a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas on my mind that I'd like to share. Many of the things that you'll hear me say tonight, I've um, I've said before, and I'm I'm feeling that I need to repeat them, partly because, uh, at least as far as uh, my critics go, they keep repeat, repeating the same refuted points over and over again. Even today, I uh, just in passing, not that I would watch uh, the channel, some people were talking about phylogeny again and uh, advertising it as, as if it's good evidence for evolution. I refuted it a few days ago. No one challenged it, and they just keep repeating uh, they just keep going on their merry way as if I um, point out problems with it. And I'm going to point out some more problems. So, uh, and I've been also developing my website. And in the process, I, I uh, have been collecting thoughts about what it is that we do with evidence and reasons for the Christian faith, what it can do for us, and, and why the website um, why it exists and why I'm organizing the website. The reason that uh, we have to search out evidence and reasons for the Christian God hides things. It says in Proverbs twenty-five two, it's the glory of God. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search out a matter. And uh, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field that's hidden. And um, when a man um, with great joy he realized this. He, he went and bought the field, all he had and bought the field. It's by design that uh, the Lord hides things. It's hidden enough, just enough, that people who don't want to believe, who don't want to pursue him, will be able to make relatively easy excuses to not pursue the Christian God. But those who seek him, who have a heart for him, um, who, who long for what he has to offer, uh, will pursue, pursue the Lord. They will um, they'll hold on to whatever bits of evidence might inspire them. But then as they, it's been my experience, as they find little pieces of evidence and then practice the faith throughout their life, they're going to find more and more reasons to, to believe if they're sincere. And so what can evidence and reasons also do for us? And it seemed kind of like a funny question, but I've offered this ministry I've offered to give talks at many conservative Protestant churches, and I've been appalled. Uh, not just me personally, that they wouldn't take me up on my offer. They wouldn't take their offer to give a talk. They feel, um, you know, the church model today, for whatever reason, does feel uncomfortable with dealing with evidence. Their church model is, let's avoid hard questions. Let's just give people a nice social club, a nice worship experience, and try not to offend too many people. Some polling numbers that um, uh, that investigated the reasons people go to church, it's been um, rather disappointing. Uh, at least some people who, many of the people who answered the poll were brutally honest. They said, well, I go there because uh, of the social experience. Or because family kind of, you know, I wanted to make my family happy. Uh, not a very high percentage said they they go to church feel God led them there. Some of them said they it's a good place to meet a spouse or they have a spouse that's believing and they want to go there. Um, I mean, these these uh, <laughs> offend away. I say <laughs> greetings, everyone. Um, I should controls on this. I don't multitask well. I can't talk and type and click at the same time and read. Some people are very good at it. I'm not. 
And so if I miss some X, please forgive me in advance. Um, that one just uh, managed to <laughs> managed to capture what I, um, <laughs> kind of the spirit of what I'm saying is I may offend some people with what I have to say, is that the church model, uh, and I guess uh, the leadership realize, well, okay, th if that's the demographic, we're gonna lose I mean, you think about it. If God is not the main reason for why people are going to a church, then if you make that the focus, if you make that the focus, you might, you might, you risk losing a lot of the congregation. And so it's like, well, you know, at least some leadership have enough conscience is like, well, you know, we owe the, we, we want to be committed to the Lord, but we don't want to offend people because we might reduce our numbers. I mean, that's these are just kind of the hard things. And if you have a mortgage to pay on a building that you purchased and you shouldn't have, like some churches do, uh, where they have, they've accumulated a huge, huge amount of debt, I can understand there's pressure to keep the numbers up and the donations going in. And uh, it just, it, it, it's, it's a tough situation to be in. And so there could be systemic things why there's compromise. And so the one thing they don't, I realize, they don't like to do, and I've at, actually, the few times that I've had a chance to gather as Christians, I'll say, okay, when was the last time you had a sermon that talked about creation, the miraculous special creation of life as an interpretation? How many times in your life have you heard it? Some guys said no, zero. Uh, the typical response over the last two decades, they may have gotten two sermons at most. I happened to attend a, a church that had a, um, a chemistry major who's very bright and his son became a medical doctor. Uh, he got, at least one of his sons went to Johns Hopkins University, so I'm presuming it was that son. Very intelligent family. So what, what did he do? At least maybe um, every other year or so, he would give a creation evolution talk. It was very good. It was very good, but at other churches, zero. They wouldn't cover it. How many? And then I'd ask, how many did, have you heard about Noah's flood? A literal interpretation of it. At least trying to talk about it. A lot of people said zero, except for that one pastor. That's pretty disappointing. And I've met a uh, young man. Um, who's asking questions about Noah's flood? And he said, I left the faith five months five months earlier, and um, he goes by the internet, I think James Cameron, and we all know that that's, that's an actor, so this is obviously a just a pseudonym that he adopted. So James was saying, um, yeah, I left the faith because no one could answer my questions about Noah's flood, and he'd been reading atheist blog that were criticizing all the issues, um, like where did the water come from? Where did it go? How about the heights of the mountains, et cetera, et cetera? And I said, so no one's talked to you. He said, no. And he said, I'm, by the way, I'm a son of an elder. And it really pains me because, um, you know, I'm going to hurt a lot of people. A lot of people are going to be disappointed and hurt to find out I no longer believe. And I said, so no one talked to you. So I spent an hour giving him what I knew. I, I pointed out the fact the um, simple things like how do things fossilize? How do you get a dinosaur that's so enormous to fossilize? It has to be buried very quickly. I showed him about sediment segregation and he said, that's really interesting. I could tell he was, I said, so no one's really pointed this out to you. And, and uh, sadly, I've not heard back from this gentleman and I, I totally wish him well, but how many you know, churches are like, no, we, do, we don't feel comfortable talking about this. Um, that's just how they feel. And not that I'm defending their actions, but I am saying I, I perhaps somewhat understand. To deal with evidence and reasons for the Christian faith, you actually have to appeal to stuff that's outside the Bible to affirm the Bible. Think about that. A lot of evidence and reasons for the Christian faith is outside the Bible to affirm that the Bible is true. They automatically feel very uncomfortable, uncomfortable with that. 
understandably, I think they would feel just very comfortable if you just read from the Bible and just gave a commentary. Sometimes <laughs> I can tell you that they feel maybe even comfortable with giving bad commentary. Why do I know that? There's one pastor who gave about two years, for two years I listened to him and his sermons were just totally lousy off the wall, but it fit the business model. I'm sorry to have to say that pastor <laughs> who shall not be named. Um, I mean, for, for example, I mean, uh, th this may sound harsh, but um, he one time, he gave a sermon on the book of Jonah. And what was the, what was the conclusion? He said, maybe we should question whether Jonah's about Jonah's salvation. And if you have ad his attitude, you, you should question your salvation too. And I was like, where did that come from? And he, he's supposedly a, a, a scholar. I'm just like, that's ridiculous to make. I mean, that may be your speculation, but there's so many more things to talk about in the book of Jonah than for you to be just dumping your, your speculations that's not supported anywhere in the Bible. Um, and yeah, I got kind of fed up with two years of that. One reason that I stayed is there are wonderful people there who prayed for me and my family, but I could only take so much of that. So where was I headed? It's easier to, um, to have a church policy that says, okay, we'll just teach straight from the Bible and you comment on it. The moment you try to, you know, they feel uncomfortable. It's like, okay, are you going to... How are you going to try to prove the Bible? Oh, I'm going to take principles from chemistry, biochemistry, cell biology. Um, we'll study physics, astrophysics, cosmology, history, and archaeology. They feel very uncomfortable with that. They feel very uncomfortable with that. It's like, what, what does this have to do? You know, we're, <laughs> you need to be talking about the love of Jesus. You need to be talking about evangelism. And I, I found some really sad... Um, it's a mixed bag. <laughs> um, some of you can tell that I've had um, a lot of disappointments in church because uh, they nearly made an atheist or really more of an agnostic. I, I wouldn't go so far to say an atheist, but they almost drove me out of the Christian faith because uh, of the way they did business uh, collectively. There's some really sweet and wonderful people there that kept kept me in the church. Thank God for them. But then there are some that were pretty harsh and hostile. I couldn't, I, I didn't feel free to express doubts. I didn't feel free to express questions without being um, denigrated and singled out and just demeaned. People had the attitudes like, oh, I'm so much better than Sal because I have so much faith. You know, look at you, you're, you have such puny faith, you know, you sinner. I mean, that's how I was treated by some of these people. They just looked down on me because I was struggling. Yeah, there was a lot of pride in the church, and they didn't have very. Some of them didn't have very good arguments, so um, they nearly drove me out of the faith. So, what drove me back? And so, those are some of the random thoughts tonight. So, uh, going back to the question I posed earlier, what can the study of evidence and reasons for the Christian faith do for you? If you study evidence and reasons for the Christian faith and you feel, and it makes God more real in your life, th that um, you begin to believe that he does see everything, and he knows everything, and he holds the future, and he's wise and is powerful, as the God described in the Bible. You begin to cherish, you begin to feel better. You want, you can't help but worship him and think about him more, and you feel like you're in his presence. And if you really believe you're in God's presence, you don't want to leave. I I have I had just um, gutsick given is here. Oh my goodness! All right, uh, welcome and thank you very much for your kind. Um, she says, "Hope you and your mom are well." And I'm sorry to say this, but actually tonight specifically, I'm going to be criticizing some of the viewpoints of phylogeny. And um, I just, you know, it's really hard to uh, disagree with people you really, really like. And Gutsick Gibbon is one of those people we go a long ways back, even to the Reddit days. Uh, and a, a funny story. Uh, I, I don't know if, you know, guys just, 
tend to be just a little harsher with each other. They're not very much into, oh, let's all agree and be unified and be sweet to each other. That's just not a guy thing, all right? And I'm kind of on the sweet side too, but I really noticed it with Guts at Given. I'm just like, who is this dude? You know, he's always being trying to be so nice and conciliatory and I'm like, what's up with him? And someone said, I think Guts is a girl. I said, nah. Yeah. <laughs> and then of course I saw her finally on the internet. I'm like, oh, <laughs> she is a girl. So kind of just a funny story. So Erica, uh, greetings to you. Uh, I, I will tell you this, some people are not happy that I'm friends with you and Dr. Dan and some of the other people who I think are just and Dapper Dino. I get along with you guys well, and I don't get along with some of the creationists. They don't think I'm polemic enough. I don't support some of their views and their arguments. And um, I've had a falling out with us. So <laughs> I have had a falling out, and I'll continue to have falling out with some of the people on my side. Um, so gut sick. Uh, yeah, tonight I'm going to be covering some things that are critical of evolutionary theory. Um, and so um, uh, just just hang on if you want to hear why I'm a creationist. Uh, nothing, nothing personal at all. People have been inviting me on modern day debate, and they said, you need to debate Erica. I said, no, we've had an agreement. And then also those for those who came to last night's talk or, or, or seen it in recording, uh, I talked about Brandolini's Law. And the short format debates are not a good venue for uh, really hashing out arguments to their completion. An example of the way you it, it can be done when it's more or less one side who's really determined and has the facts on their side to argue their case, if they have free reign to just make the very best case that they can, just like in a courtroom and you have a judge that's gonna uh, allow so any sort, you know, a wide variety of testimony, it's gonna be like James Tour spending 10 hours on YouTube to refute that's a garbage by Dave Farina. That was a epic, classic beat. And that's the way to do a debate. Um, and not let the other guy just get away with saying short things and then the debate's over before you can call him out properly with all the data and um, some very careful. So uh, tonight, boy, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought briefly. So, uh, but when, when you feel like you're in God's presence, you don't want to leave. That's what evidence and reasons is about. And and in the Bible, Jesus said, um, if you're under the lilies of the valley, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, but I tell you Solomon in all, in all his glory is not, was not arrayed as one of these. That verse means far more to us who are creationists than intelligent design advocates in the 21st century than any, than and at any time in Christendom, because all, as you could tell, even in part in James Tour's talk, all the collective knowledge of all the synthetic chemists, we may be able to go to the moon and build space probes and supercomputers, but we cannot match what God has built, even in the humble lily of the valley. And as uh, the Lord pointed out, uh, this is like grass that it's here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow. And yet, it is beyond anything that we know how to build. Seeds, all of our technologies, um, even though we've been able to do some spectacular things, God is still a better designer than us, and he's shown it in biology. And so things which churches don't really like to focus on, right? And as much time allowing people to present on creation science as they do talking about fundraising, um, I think I, I think there, I think we'd be losing less people. You're losing less of the young, and them leaving the church. That's just my feeling, because I looked at the polls and Christianity is going way down now. To some extent, this was prophesied. Jesus said, "Wide is the way 
narrow is the way that leads to life, but you know, what is the way that leads to destruction? And he said, narrow is the way. Few will find it. Few will find it. And that's an interesting thing if you think about it. And then I hear on this channel on the hiddenness of God. One reason that God hides some things, it's not so hidden you can't absolutely find it. There's lots there. Example is intelligent design and creation science, to archaeology and church history. If it's carefully studied, you'll, you'll at least say, hey, you know, there's not zero evidence. Um, there's a chance this could be true. I mean, I think if that's an if someone's going to believe a biogenesis and evolutionary theory, if you're ranking that as quote, quote factual, and you could what we have in intelligent design, creation, science, archaeology, history, the work of God and people, I think the evidence, certainly for those of you listening to me who've experienced God's power, and um, I've consistently heard it, especially from some of the most de some of the most dedicated. Christians, God had worked a miracle in your life at some time, or some, and you know, it's just been my experience. I talked to these people. I said, "What happened? You know, you're a Christian. Tell me your story." It's like, yeah, my, you know, I'll give you a specific example. One guy said um, his dad had cancer. He was about to go into surgery, and then he suddenly, he was praying. Suddenly, he felt like honey coming through him, and the doctors began to operate. The cancer was gone. He was cured. It affected even the doctors. The recovery was so strong. That's going to affect not just the individual who suffered cancer, but everyone uh, cl close in that family. And this is this happens. It's very rare, but it happens. So um, that's what I think evidence and reasons can can do for us. It's it's hidden, but if you're willing to see it, you can find it. And Jesus said, few are those who find the way. That means it's by design. And then, you know, we have to, um, I did a talk on the hidden God. And, you know, that that is a tough question. It's like, why would God want to separate some of some people from another? He wants the people. He's separating the people who really want to be with him from those that don't. He's made it such, this is a filter for people who really want the Lord and what he has to offer and are willing to sacrifice because the Christian life for many people will entail sacrifice to things you love in this world. And I, I totally get that. I mean, there's some things that I wouldn't even call inherently evil, but Jesus said you have to love him more than your own life, more than the life of your spouse, your children, and that's kind of hard. In some countries, this is really hard. You you sign up with the Lord. You're gonna you may have to give up everything you love. And there's nothing inherently wrong with loving your own family, but Jesus has to be first. And it's tough. I totally, I totally get that. And, and 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 so God does make it so that only those who really want him are going to be the ones to find him. He's going to make it really easy that if you don't want him, uh, he's going to make it easy for those people not to find him. So I, I've been in recent debates. Some of you may have seen my debate with Amy Newman and uh, Raging Atheists. And somewhere in the debate, they said, well, even if we had all the evidence of the Christian God, uh, we would believe he exists, but then they would follow Satan. That's an example of the people that would seek after the Christian God. And it, it makes it very easy for them to ignore evidence because even if it were there, they wouldn't care about it anyway. And I look back at uh, Raging Atheist's opening remarks. None of his remarks dealt with the evidence. Very it was more about why he doesn't like God and why you shouldn't either and why other people shouldn't either. And that, again, echoes with something he later said, that uh, he was agreeing with Amy Newman that he'd rather ser serve Satan because uh, what they just don't want to serve the Christian God. Uh, the facts are not ultimately important because they wouldn't serve him anyway, even if you could hypothetically, or if God even appeared to them, they would 
they're the sort, and you see this in the New Testament, um, they're the sort that would hate God. In the New Testament, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. What was the action? They wanted to kill him. You couldn't have, someone rose in Lazarus, of course, picture of, of the sort of Jesus Christ had from the dead. Uh, but Christ rose from the dead and was ascended, presumably just rose from the dead and then lived out his life. But even miracles, you could see the hatred. They, they want to him. And we find that kind of hard, you know, probably a few decades ago, I kind of found that hard to accept. But then now you meet people that would do the same. I mean, it, I mean, if someone has just said publicly that they'd rather serve Satan, so if Jesus worked a miracle for them, they're they're not going to be happy about that. I mean, that's just uh, that that's a little bit alarming. So, I have a I prepared a um, slideshow. <laughs> Hopefully, I didn't totally mess it up. Uh, and I'll open with Richardson's principle. I call it Richardson's principle. And let me, I'm just uh, clicking here to get things squared away. And let me make sure I have all my buttons, all my buttonology all set up. Okay, so what is Richardson's principle? Before, um, yeah, before I uh, go there, uh, hang on, let me acknowledge, uh, I'm going to go through the comment section here. Um, Patrick Alexander, greetings. Um, Gavin Hurlman, Raman, uh, Stalwart here, Jeremy, Jungle, Honesty Angel. Andrew Graham, greetings to Erica. Who, the, uh, there are two Ericas here, Erica Gutzik Gibbon and Erica Hubner. Andrew Graham, greetings. Cheryl. Oh, what, what was this about? All this nonsense about free speech and I was timed out in the... Uh, not on this channel. I hope. I hope you're talking about another channel, Erica. You know you're welcome here. Um, uh, oh, I guess this is a fight about stuff on another channel. Okay, if you need to fight, uh, I guess. I guess. Yeah, that's how some of these fights go. And um, bond. Uh, is this another? I think there are two bonds, uh, George Bond and, and another bond. I don't know which bond you are. If you're George Bond, um, thank you for all the jokes. If you're the other bond, greetings anyway. And there's Tony Maurice. Caleb is here, and Tony Maurice. And of course, the other Erica. And uh, Guts of Gibbon, who is already visited and I am very honored. Christian Northam, yes. It, it's not often we see you. And if I miss someone, sincere apologies in advance. It's really hard to go through the list because uh, there's quite a lot of conversation. Oh, let's acknowledge the Restream bot. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so if I miss someone, uh, apologies in advance. Oh, Sandy is here. Sandy, uh, 815, I sent you an email on Tuesday. We'll be talking about the Taylor Prism. And if that time doesn't work, please let me know. And we'll try to work something out because I, I want people to hear what um, you have to say. And uh, the Taylor Prism is something that um, has meant a lot to me. And I saw Andrew Kaufman here somewhere. There was another, there's uh, a few people named Andrew, and I think I missed Andrew Kaufman. Ray Giordano, greetings. And someone said, yeah, there's an Andrew Kaufman. I'll just, 
I'll say greetings, Andrew Kaufman. And so, and, and uh, let's see, there was one, I think I got through almost all the messages. Uh, Sparky's here. Boy, we got a big show. Um, this is, um, <laughs> I guess this is a good time and, and I, I do better. Um, by announcing, feel free to call me Gutsick Gibbon for ease there, Sal, laugh out loud. I'm not used to being one of two Erica's. Okay, so going going back to Richardson's principle. And the, okay, that's a funny picture of me. I'm kind of embarrassed. But anyway, the, the, the point that I was making was this is where um, Richardson's principle came out when we were just talking and uh, he was echoing some of the discussion that was ha happening on the stream and he said atheism doesn't provide answers to anything. Atheism doesn't provide answers to anything. And for those of you know who know Randolph Richardson, he's an atheist. Um, I almost think he's you can even call him an atheist activist. Uh, if that's not the case, Randolph, I sincere apologies to you in advance. Um, and I found this very interesting because that was what I had been kind of alluding to, and that's one reason I came back to the Christian faith. I came back to the Christian faith because atheism doesn't provide answers to anything. And that, that wasn't meant, you know, I appreciated Randolph saying this because I didn't, if a Christian said it, that sounds kind of inflammatory, but that wasn't that wasn't the reason I was, you know, trying to articulate it. I said it's just a logical conclusion, and and other people, even atheists, and to some extent, even people I've debated, like Amy, were were echoing that idea that atheism, you know, there's, you know, it's like okay, I like so if if someone says they don't believe in God. If someone says they don't believe in God, they lack belief in the in a deity. How is it from that that you can say, okay, because I don't believe in God, therefore this is right and this is wrong. I don't believe in God, therefore, um, therefore I have hope. It's like, well, it doesn't connect. We call that in logic a non sequitur. It's like saying two plus two equals four, therefore the sky is blue today. It just doesn't connect. There's nothing that follows from either insistence there's no God, that is the stronger statement of atheism, which is over the last few decades have gotten a softer statement just saying it's lack of belief. So if you lack belief in God, so we have kind of two definitions of atheism or kind of a spectrum of definitions. How is it that you can decide meaning and purpose, uh, morals, ethics, purpose, what's right and wrong, uh, the value of human life or the value of anything for that matter. Uh, and R Randolph Richardson stated it well. Now, I've rephrased it. I hope he doesn't mind. I, it's just easier for me to say there are no answers in atheism. There are no answers in atheism. What this means also is if there are no answers in atheism, many times that implies decision-making will have to be made uh, with some level or sometimes a complete level of pure faith without any evidence. So decisions that are made as to what's right and wrong, it may be just what your preference is. You have no proof in the ultimate sense um, that it's right or wrong. And it may be in a worldview without atheism, there's, no, there's nothing that's ultimately, in terms of ethics, provable. Um, and uh, someone asked, uh, what was the comment by John Lang? He was, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have it. Uh, I did provide the original context here. And uh, I will say this, Randolph, so you can, you can get it here, the March 28, 2021. The timestamp was around 248.43. Now, Randolph Richardson has since heard me, and he didn't come about my characterization that there are no answers in atheism. If anyone has, if, if he has an issue with that, I, I'm willing to be corrected, but 
to the best of my knowledge and in my subsequent interactions with him, he said, that's just the logical conclusion. And I have, you know, I, I see no reason why that is in fact. If you lack in God, what do you deduce about much of anything? What do you deduce about much of anything? So in a poignant example of that there's no answers in atheism is this militant atheist, Peter Bogassian. Peter Bogassian uh, wrote a manual. <laughs> he wrote a manual for creating atheists. And I'm pretty sure this is the manual where he introduces the idea of street, street epistemology. Street epistemology. I think that is a kind of a um, take on the idea of street evangelism. He called it street epistemology. And so these street epistemologists get out there and just start asking people questions saying, I just want, you know, I'm interested to know. And that's actually kind of deceptive because their interest is to try to destroy people's faith, to, to get in their face and kind of mock them. Uh, now, I encountered a street epistemology, epistemologist appearing on one of my Reddit subs. I confronted him and he ran away because uh, I tried to give him a pretty sharp rebuttal. I wasn't mean to him personally, but I pointed out his hypocrisy and um, some sketchy things that he had said. Uh, I guess he wasn't counting on, counting on me kind of calling him out. So this street epistemologist will go around trying to ask people, why do you believe this or that? And I realized the way to confront these guys is to say, okay, if, if you're an atheist, uh, what answers do you have? Because according to the Richardson principle, there are no answers in atheism. And an example of this being really kind of poignant was uh, Peter Bogassian's mother. And I, 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 I thank him for his honesty here, was dying, was terminally ill. He couldn't bring himself to talk her out of her faith. Because on one level, uh, probably on the level that he believed, is that um, she got comfort from this. This is like anesthesia to someone who's in a lot of pain. You're trying to just deaden the nerves. I, I'm presuming that um, almost everyone is dying. It, it's... <laughs> um, a lot of times it involves some degree of pain. They have to give people fentanyl or, or these painkillers. Um, you know, there's some people um, mercifully like Antony, I think it was Justice Chief Just, I mean, Justice Scalia, who, who died peacefully in his sleep, as far as we know. Um, I'm told that if someone dies of a serious, of a massive stroke, they probably don't even feel it. Their, their brain just shuts off and they go to sleep permanently. Um, but he couldn't bring himself to do that. And I want to say good on him. That was sensible. He realized that it, it did give comfort to his mother to believe that she's going to be with Jesus soon. He couldn't bring himself to argue with her. And I'm like, yeah, don't, you have nothing to offer. You can't even comfort the dying with your, with your cynicism and skepticism. Skepticism, that's not what someone wants to hear. And though he probably would disagree with me, he said, the bottom line is it could be true, and you're just open to it. It really could be true that his mother was going to heaven, and he has nothing to offer. That's Richardson's principle. When I nearly left the Christian faith 20 years ago, and it wasn't because, it wasn't so much because of the atheists, it was the lack of, it was the bad treatment I was getting in church, um, their unwillingness and inability to try to deal with some of my questions. And like I said, there seemed to be almost kind of a faith pride. It's like they really looked down on people that were struggling with their faith. And now that I look back, that was pretty nasty, you know? They just felt that they were in a higher tier because they didn't, you know, they, they didn't seem to have those struggles. They just looked at people that were weak and afflicted, and I really was. I mean, I, I was not. Um, I was not functional. What really precipitated this was my my father was terminally ill. I was praying, and it, you know, I didn't hear God speak, and God didn't heal him, and I totally forgot about all the other miracles he'd worked in the family's life, 
but so, you know, when you're grieving, you just don't think quite as straight. Um, it was the fact that I did have some spiritual experiences that kind of tipped the balance. So let me share a, a scripture here. This was in John 6, 68, when Jesus was giving some hard teachings and his disciples were saying, this is a hard, this is hard to accept. And a lot of the, a lot of the people that were following Jesus up until that point just left. And then Jesus asks and turns to his, uh, to the remainder. He said, are, are you all gonna, are you gonna leave? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Now I've, um, some people like Pine Creek Doug and others have said, I don't want eternal life. Or they'd rather go to hell than be with a Christian God forever. Uh, and just you get a whole spectrum. And by the way, I should just, this reminds me of something that our Lord and Savior said. He said, by your word justified, by your words you will be condemned. These things that people say, on Judgment Day, they pronounce sentence on themselves. Unless they repent, um, they basically already pronounce sentence. If, if, if someone says that, even flippantly, uh, I think the Lord's going to call them into account for what they have said, because that's what the Scripture teaches. And and and, and so yeah, there there's some people that say they don't want eternal life. And as I said, why is it that God makes it easy? Why does he hide things and make it easy for people to disbelieve? And a little bit harder, it takes work. It says the work of God is to believe on Jesus. And you're like, why should it even take any work? I mean, I don't have to exert any effort to believe the air I breathe is real. Why should it take work? Well, if you're a detective, it takes work to get after the truth. And in terms of us searching for the truth, God has ordained the hidden evidence for us to search like a detective so that we can find it and be assured. But you're not gonna look for many people unless unless you have a heart for God. And so it says here, Lord, to whom? Um, I'll bring up that verse again. Uh, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. To people that are sensitive to the Christian God, these words will mean a lot. And it's something that you'll pursue. I wanted to, I, I'd like to point out, um, we, it's human nature, it's human nature to take a risk for something you love. It's human nature to take a risk for something you love. Um, you may not know um, that something will happen the way you want, but you'll take a risk for it. Uh, I'll give just an example one off the top of my head, they were uh, doing the the Battle of the Atlantic in World War II. It's a horrible situation where the uh, German, the Nazi submarines were sinking Allied uh, merchant ships that were bringing supplies to Great Britain to pro you know to prosecute the war. And um, some of these merchant sailors, uh, their boat would be torpedoed. They'd have to cling to a lifeboat out there in the cold Atlantic waters. Many of them died. I mean, a lot of them died. I, I hear, remember numbers on the order of 30,000, possibly more. It was just horrible. But let's say you're on one of those lifeboats clinging for your life. You have to take measures to try to extend your life as long as you can in the hope of getting rescued. That means you have to ration water. You have to try to take care of yourself and you, you don't eat too much. You try to keep yourself psychologically um, as together as you can, given these tough circumstances. And some of these people would wait weeks before they're rescued. They're just floating out there in the cold water. Sadly, some people, they break psychologically and they're just, they just quit. They'll jump out of the boat and just decide not to live anymore. So what does this have to do with believing? There's a sense that if you really want to live, let's say you have loved ones that you need to go back to, let's say you have a, a kid back home that needs his dad, you're gonna act a certain way if you really want 
If you really want it, you're going to try everything you can. Even though you don't want, have 100% assurance that you're going to live, you're going to act like you're going to live because you're going to take, you're going to take actions consistent with what you love. You'll also risk for what you love. Like um, if someone that you love is in danger and it might cause injury to you to rescue them, you'll, you'll take that risk. And that's what I mean. You take risks for what you love. You don't need 100% certainty to act with a certain degree of faith. And when I debated, and this is what I call Dillahunty's dilemma, um, he acted very authoritative and strong and just screaming at me. And, you know, people just ate it up uh, because there's a saying that it's not what you say, it's how you say it. He, he's very theatrical and just sounded so authoritative and believable uh, in his body language and what he talked, but really what he said was just utter garbage. And there's one part in the debate I laughed at him and he took offense. He said he makes craps. He plays craps, a casino dice game for a living. I laughed at him because I knew better because I'm a skilled gambler. I laughed at him. He corrected himself because he knew I had him there. And uh, he probably sensed, yeah, Sal, Sal knows who I am. And he probably sensed that I kind of, you know, unfortunately, I did kind of disregard him. I, I felt he was pretty shallow and self-contradictory in his thinking. And if we, if it weren't for Brandolini's law, where someone can, you know, the the BS asymmetry principle, if this were an extended debate, uh, I, I probably would have totally crushed him. But he could just, you know, right in the middle of me making a point, he'll interrupt because I'm just about ready to just crush him, and he'll interrupt and scream and call me dishonest and despicable. That was his playbook. <clears throat> I, I thought far less of him after that debate because that was pretty sketchy, uh, the way he debated. Um, I asked him specifically, I said, okay, if Jesus healed you like that blind man, would you follow him? And he said, no. And then I said, then you probably nothing will persuade you. Now, it did turn out he made a video before the debate where he said, well, if I saw a miracle. I can't rule out space aliens as an explanation. He said, so I, I don't think there's any, you know, I, I don't know that I would believe. He said, I don't think I would believe. He specifically said that. He made a whole video on this. And so when I repeated basically what he would have said himself, he said, you're attacking my character. You're attacking my character. That's despicable. That's so dishonest. It's like, no. What's dishonest about Matt there was I just repeated what he said and I, he got caught. I caught him. I called him out on it and he got caught right there in the middle of the debate and he didn't like that. And so he threw it back at me and started calling me dishonest and despicable. And there were a few things where I just repeated simple facts and, and the guy was just flowing, <laughs> flying off the handle. So what does that have to do with anything? What does he do? He goes to Las Vegas and plays dice. There's no guarantee. In fact, the reason I laughed at him when he said he plays craps for a living, which is the dice game, is that the casino has an edge. You play it long enough, the casino is going to grind you to the ground. We know that. It's called the law of large numbers. It follows the law of large numbers. If you've heard me talk about abiogenesis, I'll often use the law of large numbers to make my argument, and it plays out in the casino. So Matt here, Dillahunty, will go off to Las Vegas because he wants a thrill. And he knows the chance, the odds are against him, but he loves it. He'll take the risk because that's what he loves. He's willing to take a risk on a losing game because he loves it. And so the point is that if you love the Christian God, if God has put it in your heart, for some reason, you'll seek him. It says in the Bible, we love him because he first loved us. And that leads to very interesting theological territory. We don't have to go there tonight. Uh, some of you who know um, my reformed leanings uh, <laughs> know where I would go, know where I would go with that. But the point is, is if you have a heart for the Lord, even if you're not 100% sure, you're going to act out. You're going to practice your faith a certain way. You're going to practice your faith a certain way. And I am wanting to write a book on cures for doubting Thomas for Christians that are struggling with their faith as I did. And 
one of the principles is is you will take a risk for what you love if you're if you're the sort of doubting thomas that's like i really don't want the faith i'm out that book isn't for you if you're the sort of doubting thomas who was like the, the apostolic doubting thomas who clearly loved the lord but was just skeptically minded and for you know um that's just the way he's wired by the way i want to say this people like doubting thomas like myself like people in the sciences and engineering we want you know we love evidence it's reassuring when i do engineering work i'm glad when someone reviews it and says hey, and tests it testing is very important because then you you get more faith in in the product you're building and it extends to the idea also christian faith certain people are just wired to spend more time desiring evidence that's not a bad thing i'll actually say it's a noble thing that you want god doing stuff in your life and making himself evident in your life that's a beautiful noble thing and maybe the way to deal with that is to is really to study things like intelligent design creation science archaeology history and there are a few other things that you know um, that that you can study. And I found in the process of studying that, the very first thing you learn is that there are no answers in atheism. It's not going to comfort you near the time of your death. And so let me see what the next scripture is. All right, this is a beautiful passage in scripture, Matthew 9, 27 through 30. There's a lot of rich theology here. And Jesus passed on from there. Two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. I, I actually um, think God has um, a pretty good sense of humor, more than we probably give him uh, credit for. And that's one example Jesus said, see to it that no one knows about it. And and these, he knew that these people couldn't keep the secret. I mean, you're suddenly with your eyes wide open. <laughs> And, you know, just imagine it. You, you walk around and people know that you couldn't see. And now you can see. What? How are you going to hide this? Really something comical. Jesus said, see that no one knows about it. You can't hide the fact when Jesus opened your eyes and you were blind. This does have to do with what we're talking about. And this is also, this is a difficult passage, as you may not think. I remember w one time we were singing a song that was celebrating that was celebrating um, Jesus healing blind men, and there was someone in the church group who was blind. And I was thinking to myself, I wonder how he feels, because Jesus healed these people, and he's not healing this man who's blind, and. It, I'm not one of those people who says God's going to heal everyone who believes in him and, and that it's a lack of faith if you're not seeing. That's not what the Bible teaches because it clearly says in the Gospels that when you make a feast, invite the whole lame and the blind, the implication being that these are people that are welcomed into your home and presumably you're you know, because Jesus had commanded his apostles to heal people. In this case, he's saying invite them. The implication is that that aren't going to be healed. These people being healed of blindness is a sign that God has the power to heal all, all sorts of things. When people are raised from the dead, they will be completely restored. People raised from the dead and who love the Lord and who welcome his coming, they will, this, this is a sign. This is hope for people that are of all sorts of ailments, that God has power to help them. 
Now, of course, you know, if you're you were skeptical, uh, it was. It's understandable that we'll say, oh, it's just a story. But see, this is why, this is why we study creation science, intelligent design, archaeology, history, and other things, because as we have evidence that this is true, that parts of the Bible are true, it gives us assurance that these parts of the Bible are true. And as I said, there are no as principle says there are no answers in atheism. At least here, there's a chance that this could be right. That this could be right. So for the doubting Thomases, it's a spark of hope. And what's beautiful about this passage, if you think about what these blind men and what their prospects are, especially in an in an economy, <clears throat> uh, I'd expect unless they were they came from a wealthy family, they would have to be begging and counting on people's mercy because it's very hard to to make a living in a primitive environment to care for yourself. They didn't have many prospects. And when you don't have many prospects and you hear about the Messiah, that sounds really good. So in my debate with Amy, Amy Newman and Raging Atheist, they're just talking about all the harm and, and just like all the cruelty in the Old Testament. You know something? That all becomes moot. That all becomes moot when you don't have a lot of prospects in your life and someone, the Lord himself, is offering you an out, offering you mercy. It's like, are you going to question at that point an attitude that um, God disapproves of certain behaviors and approves of others? Um, I don't think so. And that's a principle I want to convey. Christianity, and it alludes to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 through 30 or 31, that God cho chooses the despised of the world to shame the wise and the affluent. He chooses the people that are outcasts and those who don't have a lot of hope. And throughout the history of Christianity, it has especially, the message of the gospel has especially touched people who have no hope in this world. They have nothing to lose by calling out and crying aloud to the Lord, as it said here. And uh, sometimes, sometimes when you're, you know, you're just like on that life, but what are you going to do? You can either choose to give up or you keep trying and hoping you'll be rescued. And that's what I tried to tell people um, is, you know, you don't need 100% proof to start acting out a certain way and acting out your faith, you will act out, your actions will actually show what you really believe more so than maybe what you say. So now let me see what else I had on the docket of things to talk about. So well, um, I was saying this illustrates the principles of Pascal's wager. It contrasts with Richardson's principle and antitheism. Richardson's principle is that eight, Atheism has no answers for anything. There are no answers in atheism. The Christian faith has answers. It's contingent. The quality of the answer is contingent on whether it's ultimately true. To lose. You have nothing to lose because atheism is an alternative. You have nothing there anyway. And um, being a, I really learned this as a skilled gambler. There are certain bets that you take that have zero chance of loss. And substantial opportunity for gain. Um, we call, in, in the casino world, we call those free bets. They're, they're sometimes offered by the casinos as a marketing tool, but you take them. When you're given a free bet, you take it. And I, I, made, I, made, I made money on free bets. I mean, it's, it's actually hard not to make money on free bets if you get my drift. Um, now, that's not to encourage people to, to gamble. It, it, uh, <laughs> That's a whole another story. And then, um, so that, you know, the contrast with Richardson's principle, Richardson's principle and also, um, I said antitheism, uh, just take it or leave it, but I'm just trying to make a, a contrast. And there's Luke 23, 43. This is probably one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible because I have seen myself and others. Let me see if I have it. 23, I didn't copy it. Anyway, 
what is Luke 23, 43? Let me see if I can just call it up on um, Bible Gateway here. Luke 43, 43. I'll use the... This is the account of the thief on the cross. So I'm just gonna put it here. Probably one of the, I mean, to me, when I um, talk about verses in the Bible that are to me the, the most beautiful, it simply said, Luke 23, 43. And he said to him, that is the thief on the cross, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And you know, for, for people that have lived a good life, I mean, like they've accomplished a lot, they have a lot, they, they could legitimately say that they're proud of, uh, um, that, that they've helped people. And, you know, they don't have maybe too many regrets like this thief. Uh, I can understand that they, they, they might be hard-hearted toward the Christian God. But if you're someone that is weighed down with guilt for bad decisions that you've made in life, you feel you've totally messed up, and you're like this thief on the cross, you, uh, you hate yourself, you hate the people, you hate the world you're in, you hate the mess you've made of your life, there you are just nailed to a cross, and you know uh, breaths is gonna be uh, short enough, life is gonna be short, you don't, it's gonna be a painful death, you totally, totally messed up, and you know you deserved it, and here's the Messiah, he says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. What did what did the thief say before this exchange? And it's, it's a very interesting exchange because uh, as I looked at this passage, it was obvious, it was obvious that, um, it was obvious that the people talking around were acknowledging Christ's miracles because someone in that passage said, Others, why didn't he say? Why doesn't he save himself? And one of the thieves was mocking and said, "Save yourself and us." So apparently, it was very obvious that he, uh, to the people that were talking, to the people that were listening on this, that Jesus had worked miracles. People were acknowledging it. The thief on the cross, one of them, it started to dawn on him: Oh my goodness, he is the Messiah. I don't know, maybe he couldn't quite figure out why the Messiah was crucified there, but um, why the Messiah was crucified there. But he had the sense to say, if this is the Messiah, let me ask him. He said, Lord, remember me. If that's the one act you do, just say, Lord, remember me. And Christianity appeals to people like that who've messed up and need a restart in their life. Um, atheism doesn't offer that because atheism has no answers. And that's one of the reasons the Christian message has been deeply appealing. But ultimately, the reason it should be believed is not because it has a nice story. It's because it's true. But that should be motivation for a lot of people that don't have their lives together, that have a lot of regrets, they can call upon the name of the Lord and he promises to fix it, not necessarily in this world. Okay, so for this thief, it still didn't end, in worldly terms, it still didn't end well. They broke his legs and he died, okay? But he was remembered in heaven and that's a precious thing. So how does this relate to the study of evidence and reasons? You see, uh, when we're in tight straits, isn't it comforting to be reassured that what you believe has evidence and reasons behind it? And just for people that are skeptical like myself, just isn't sufficient to be preached at every Sunday and screamed at. There's some preachers that just, it, it seems that they're able, to, they seem to think that the louder that they scream, the more faith that they can instill. Um, Sorry, you could tell I've had some bitter experiences at church. So, uh, but that this this verse is uh, very precious to me. So now,
Let me uh, now parry with the theistic evolutionists. I think they're doing a lot to destroy people's faith. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to talk about evolutionary theory because Richard Dawkins did acknowledge, he said, um, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. If we read his passage there, he's talking about the fact that like, well, you can dismiss God, but the fact of the appearance of design is very problematic. And Darwin gave an explanation. I'll argue that it's a false explanation, but he at least gave an explanation that was intellectually satisfying to people like Richard Dawkins. Uh, first off, it does fail because it, uh, it doesn't explain the origin of life. Um, and we heard James Tour give just wonderful explanations of the complexity and the difficulties that have to be overcome. And even though he would not publicly affirm intelligent design, just about everyone who heard him that's sympathetic to intelligent design could see where this was going. So Dawkins is wrong there. Secondly, natural selection in the way that Darwin envisioned. I'm going to use, I call it Emery's axiom, natural selection prevents evolution of complex. Natural selection prevents evolution and accumulation of complexity. I'll discuss that in relation to butterflies. But where this is really devastating, and by the way, I think I might be having an occasional um, show where I, I say the debate that never was, where I'll say, okay, this is a debate that never happened, but this is how it should play out in terms of what I want to say. Some might have a debate, so to speak, that never was with Aaron Raw or uh, Matt, you know, Matt Dillachunky, uh part two on Pascal's wager, because then I have a chance to actually circumvent their use of Brandolini's law, where they could just pump out BS and it's going to take me, you know, for every minute they speak, I need 60 minutes to uh, refute them properly, which can be done if I have time. And that's the purpose of some of these debates that never was. By the way, one of these is coming up, uh, tentatively scheduled for April 30th with me and Rob Stadler. Um, what happened is the pair wanted to debate me and John Maddox. And I just in the process of circulating, I said, okay, we don't know. We never know what the tag team's going to be on the day of the debate anyway. Um, why don't we line up some substitutes? And I said, Rob Stadler or James Carter. James Carter said, well, I'm not really good in debate. Um, and, and so Rob Stadler said, okay, I'll try. And when that was put on the table, John Maddox said, okay, he's, he's on the first team then, so to speak. Uh, when the, the other side, which is called Gnos Gnosis, uh, someone by the name of Nathan and James Foder heard, they folded. They said, no, we don't want to debate that team. They don't want to debate Salvador Cordova and Rob Stadler. <laughs> so, okay. Um, I, I contacted Rob shortly, uh, like, you know, less than an hour after that, I said, let's just cancel this. This, I'm not eager to be, you know, letting them utilize Brandolini's law. Let's just have our own show and say, okay, we're going to make the presentation we really wanted to make um, anyway. And so that's happening on the 30th. So some of the content I'm going to do here, I, I'm jokingly calling it the debate that never was between me and Aaron Raw. Um, this stemmed from an exchange I had, very polite with Aaron Raw, and I was telling him um, who I was, and uh, I, I told him that uh, I worked for uh, Dr. Sanford as a research assistant, and at the time I was a graduate student also at the um, at the uh, National Institutes of Health FAS Graduate School, and I tried to explain to Aaron Raw who Dr. Sanford was. And, and and Ross said, you know, I need to, you know, I told him that Dr. Sanford's a creationist. He said, well, let me send you some material. Maybe that could change his mind. I wanted to laugh. I said, yeah, Aaron Ross is going to teach a famous geneticist, a world famous geneticist um, about genetics. And uh, Aaron Ross used the term phylogenetic systematics, phylogenetic systematics. And I knew where this was going. He's going to be talking about the nested hierarchy. And I'm going to criticize, I've criticized the nested hierarchy. Um, 
on the molecular level, I showed why um, even microevolution nested hierarchies within the same protein family are ridiculous because of the absence of nuclear localization when you go from the prokaryotic to the eukaryotic architecture. So even changes in small segments of the, of the DNA, if they don't happen, it's lethal instantly. Natural selection would actually prevent the evolution of that sort of complexity. And I said, all these phylogenetic reconstructions are, if they're being put forward as evidence of evolution, they fail. They're insufficient. They're non sequiturs. We can do that at the morphological level with monarch butterflies. And by the way, um, on some level, and I'm sure some Christian writers probably have observed this, um, it, 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 the butterfly's development cycle, and they go counterclockwise here, <laughs> where we start off with like say a larva, a pupa, and then it goes into a cocoon. So you have this caterpillar that goes in the cocoon, it melts all its body parts, it liquefies them, and then it reassembles it into a butterfly. It reminds people of the resurrection. We call this process the metamorphosis process. And this is actually very problematic for natural selection. And it also is stating to the use of phylogenetic reconstructions or what Aaron Ra would call um, phylogenetic systematics. It doesn't say that the nested hierarchies don't exist. It says they, you can't make the inference that things naturally evolve from this. You, you still might be able to argue for universal common answer, barely, but it would require miracles for this to, um, it would require miracles for this to, uh, to take place. So if you have universal common ancestry plus miracles, how is this very different than from intelligent design for one? It, it at least is good enough to be qualified as intelligent design in the, in the Michael Behe sense. But on some level, it's really not that different from special creation. And I made that argument to someone who was a theistic Dharma, and he was sensitive to the Lord. I could tell that. And I had an hour-long discussion with him. He was a biology student, pre-med. And I didn't talk theology with him at all. I deliberately avoided the topic. I just said, okay, what are you learning in class? Do you know the difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes? Do you know all these systems? Did the professor say how these things evolved? Can you think, do you see the problem of how this can't evolve from that. And he said, yeah, you're right. They didn't give good explanations at all. They just asserted it. And I said, you see, for this to evolve to that, let's just assume you had universal common ancestry. You still needed a miracle to make that body part or that system. How is that different then from special creation, except they don't want to admit they need a miracle. They hide that fact. I found out a few weeks later, someone told me, he said, I don't know what you said to him, Sal, but after that one hour conversation, he he stopped believing in evolution. He stopped believing in evolution. So going back to this life cycle of the monarch butterfly, and um, this is going to be, oh boy. <laughs> Sorry, just a little bit of comic relief. So I shouldn't tell Sal you called me a soy boy bond. Okay. All right, All right guys. I, I have no problem with levity. That's great because this maybe some of this is boring you guys. Anyway, how does this break natural selection? So let's just say uh, you, you had this creature, this uh, caterpillar, and that was the original form. How does it go to this stage where it just totally melts all its body parts before it's able to lay the eggs and reproduce? So the egg laying is somewhere in this later stage. The mating and egg laying is in this later stage. If it gets to this stage and it just melts all its body parts, that's that's a dead end. Now, if it, if it uh, gets, let's say hypothetically it was laying eggs at this stage, well, then there's no, you know, it melting its body parts here, um, you know, maybe that that might work, but that's speculative. 
I mean, why expend all that energy to just kind of uh, melt yourself to pieces? You know, kind of like, uh, oh, there are some scenes in movies. We don't have to go there. But how does selection select for like melting yourself in pieces? It would select against that, especially melting yourself, um, liquefying yourself, taking all your body parts, liquefying it uh, before the egg laying stage. That would be selected against. So again, to use Emery's axiom here that natural selection uh, prevents the evolution and accumulation of complexity. One way that I define complexity is the number of steps for a system to be um, uh, implemented, or steps for a certain stage of development to occur, et cetera. So this is, we could say that this is a complex, this is certainly more complex than a um, single cellular organism. The reproductive cycle is definitely way more complex. And it's more complex than if we were just a purely land creature because we have this transition to the flying creature. So this, uh, this caterpillar then starts to melt itself up. Natural selection would select against that. So there goes Darwin's theory. We can't say that, oh, you know, uh, if we disrupt this among a population of existing butterflies, if we disrupt the assembly, uh, well, the ones that would actually reassemble continue to reassemble like the normal butterfly. Uh, that's proof of that's not correct because all of them can't select for what doesn't exist. If, if you have this stage where it liquefies itself, the cocoon stage, the chrysalis stage, and you don't simultaneously have this stage where you have uh, the butterfly rebuild itself and then lay eggs, it's a dead system. It needs all those parts. Now, I'm, I did not use the word irreducible complexity. See, I had a hard time saying it. I've encouraged ID proponents, you don't need to throw all this in. Okay, acknowledging brain bug knows the Okay, I'm going to make a bet. His explanation of the evolutionary cycle, the phylogenetic reconstructions, it won't be a mechanical explanation for the problem here, but thank you for the tip. Um, thank you for the tip. Brain bug knows the lepidopteran metamorphosis evo quite well, Sal. You ought to give him a ring. Otherwise, check out the evolutionary econ. Okay, I've made my bet. Um, that is a fair point. And I always have valued Kutzik Gibbons' input because she's a graduate student, very smart. And um, we have to take the, the critics' objections very seriously. If we're going to be able to prosecute our case before, uh, before other biology students, and this has been uh, at the top, of the list of the people I wanted to reach out to you are other science students. So I thank you for that. The Evolutionary evolutionary Ecology of Mises by Brink et Alia, 2019. So I'm gonna make a bet, a mechanical explanation of how it, this doesn't die in the process of going from a caterpillar to a butterfly. It's going to be the same tired old phylogenetic reconstructions. And so that's just the bet. That's just the bet. It's not, why am I willing to make that bet? I'm going to show, um, let me see. I put this out there, periodic evolution. Let me see if I can put it up on the screen here. Anyway, for um, I might have to take, let me stop my screen sharing. Maybe I'll be more successful uh, if I stop the screen share than now try to put this up. 
Um, let me try to put this up because this is important. Because it explains why I was willing to make this bet. And it has to do with the fact I built, I did a phylogenetic reconstruction, quote unquote, with a topoisomerase molecule. And I showed why it doesn't serve as a mechanistic explanation. So let me bring this up. Um, this was in my video. On, this was in my video on the miracles of transitionals versus the stairways to understanding. I've said that the the nested hierarchies are a consequence of God making a design that is for scientific discovery. And the idea of model organisms that we couldn't do biology unless we had model organisms. And that we have a diversity of species that we can use like the squid, zebrafish, or the nematode worm to help us understand human biology. We probably wouldn't understand human biology if we didn't have bacteria, if we did just like the, the squid with the giant axon um, and uh, yeast to help us understand epigenetics, which is really amazing uh, because the would be that we would have to have, we would have to volunteer humans for human dissection to understand our own biology which wouldn't be very pleasant. Not to mention there are, the human being is so complex that it'd be much harder to figure out our biology if we didn't have simpler models like bacteria. When Marshall Nirenberg at the NIH got the Nobel Prize uh, for his discovery of the genetic code, he elucidated it. He, he used bacteria. It would have been very much harder if you were using human cells uh, because they are much more complex they, they have a chromatin architecture, things like introns, much easier for him to work with bacteria. We were able to deduce the genetic code because we had this stairway, what I call the stairways to understand. So now let me try to share my screen again and see if I could show you the topoisomerase that um, I was talking about. This is why I think I'm going to win that bet about the butterflies because when evolutionary biology just publish about how they prove the evolution of something still to these phylogenetic reconstructions. And this is one example here, the human topoisomerase and all the others like chimps, rats, mice, yeast, E. coli. You can build these diagrams and an evolutionist look at that. So that's proof that the eukaryote evolved. Numerous problems with that. The first thing that doesn't prove a eukaryote evolved. And even assuming you had a lot of the eukaryotic pieces there, I specifically called out to evolve in the topoisomerase. So in a phylogenetic reconstruction, you just measure differences. What it doesn't account for is the effect of specific sequences that would be the lift they're missing. How does this sequence evolve? It has to, you could see it's not trivial. It also has to be in the right location. This creates the nuclear localization that enables the topoisomerase to go from the cytoplasm back into the nucleus to be able to service the, um, to be able to untangle the DNA, otherwise the creature dies. And no one has solved this. I know that they haven't solved this. What they do instead is they pretend they know how it evolved because they build a phylogenetic reconstruction. And I pointed out that that's not a mechanistic explanation and ironically both Emory and I actually found a paper that said um, that was published in 2016 it was what's wrong with evolutionary biology it's a peer-reviewed paper by a biologist he's really really smart by the way we couldn't believe his depth of knowledge and he said these sort of reconstructions are not a real theory and I agree with him this is a case in point so I'm gonna say the bet is on that all we're going to get from that paper that Erica, thank you again kindly for putting it on the table, is a phylogenetic reconstruction. It's not going to explain how the creature doesn't die in the process. Why do I, am I willing to make the, that bet? Because that's the same format of, that's the same template that all the evolutionary biology literature 
builds on reasoning. It is not a mechanistic explanation like an engineer would put forward. It's like an engineer would say, how does it live in this intermediate stage? How does it not die in the process of evolving? If all they offer is phylogenetic reconstruction, that circular reasoning, it's assuming the conclusion uh, that they're trying to prove. And that circular reasoning, they don't see it. Um, and that's why I'm willing to make that bet. So let me stop. I share my screen share here. I'm going to bring up the original because I think I'm almost done. And let me. So I have I have argued this at the molecular level for cases like the, the eukaryotic transition. Now Dapper Dino was saying, "Oh, you know, Salvador thinks." If I'm mischaracterizing you, Dapper, I'm not intending to, but this is the way I remembered it. People were saying, oh, Salvador thinks if you if you disprove eukaryotic evolution, you disprove evolution. And I'm like, well, that's actually accurate. If you disprove eukaryotic evolution, you've destroyed universal common ancestry. What are you going to call it then? If you don't have universal common ancestry, uh, I've just cut it right at the root. I've cut it right at the root. But if you want me to cut higher levels, this is one example. And... Uh, there are people who may accept universal common ancestry, like um, Michael Behe, that will that will that will say, you know, I may accept universal common ancestry, ancestry nominally, but you need intelligent design. And I'm just like, yeah, that's exactly the, the point I'm conveying. It may be a harder thing to to refute universal common ancestry. Absolutely, you can do that if you can prove Noah's flood and the youth of the earth, but it's going to be, um, it, it's going to be, um, I lost my train of thought because I was looking at this comment here at the same time. I told you I can't read and write and click and uh, talk at the same time. It's going to, if, uh, it's going to be much harder, to, you know, it's going to be pretty hard to prove young earth from a, evidential standpoint, there's still some problems. I mean, compared to or, you know, the miracle of life, abiogenesis, and, and showing it required a miracle, proving the earth is young is problematic still, even though I believe it is young, it's problematic. The reason I say so is the young earth creationists themselves don't agree on what the correct model is. Um, and it's kind of ironic because they're actually trying to invoke a lot of naturalistic mechanisms, which I accept. Whereas for the origin of life, uniformly, we say that it was a miracle of God. Mechanisms we'll never be able to replicate. But for the case of the youth of the earth, we are actually trying to argue naturalistic mechanisms for how the fossil record is ordered the way it is, and then also for the um, issues with radiometric decay. So, okay, if that's what it takes to be an expert, on insects, I should waltz my way to an entomology PhD. Yes. Um, in his image, I um, in his image, I was hoping that you might do some of the work for me. You like animal biology, and I'm a cell. I'm a molecular and cell biology, protein biology, structural biology kind of guy. <clears throat> hint, hint, if you want to help me on the butterfly evolution, uh, my bet is that um, the paper that Erica kindly gave us will be nothing more but a phylogenetic reconstruction. It'll follow the template of most of the evolutionary literature that gives no explanation whatsoever. It only pretends to make an argument, which means it's not a legitimate argument. I, I've just seen this play out too many times. Um, that I'm not going to be that um, reluctant to make the bet. Um, and we've had, I think this is, okay. So Emery's here, laugh out loud. Give me a month to finish classes and I'll look into it. Thank you. That made it worth my time to put this on the table. But I can't let, oh, gut sick. You're not, you don't have the magical powers. I'm going to give them to you. 
by the way, uh, I have I have tossed some people from the channel and also demoted them. But I'm promoting you because you're special. Can you uh, try again? Uh, um, I think I think I just added you as moderator just now. Uh, but if you could test that out, that would be very that's very generous of you. Now I will point this out. Um, I, I'm sorry to pick on Leophilius here. One time I was going through this and uh, for the eukaryotic evolution and the nuclear pore complex, just like the way he does, he'll Google and say, oh, I found one right here. And he was just laughing as if he proved it. I didn't have to see, this is Brandolini's law again in play. I found it and it's like, I don't have time to read it. We're in the middle of a talk and I'm at number 10 to one. And he was just laughing away. I at the paper just briefly in the middle of this to follow. He's totally wrong. It's the same template. Speculation, phylogenetic reconstruction, no mechanistic answers. And that's 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 what I usually get from that crew. They think just because the paper is written on it that it's finally proven and figured out. It's just like the whole abiogenesis industry that James Tour called out. Um, so so when you're in a, that's why I don't like these debates. People just pull stunts like that. There's no way that any human on the planet is going to read everything that's ever written and they could pull something out obscure. You don't have time in a short debate format to be able to give it careful examination. But you know from experience that it's going to be a garbage paper, which all the abiogenesis papers pretty much are. Except the ones that actually point out the improbabilities and report things honestly. So um, I bet this issue is going to play out the same way because it played out the same way in so many instances. But in a debate, they'll say, oh, apparently Sal didn't read these papers. It's like, well, I'm not going to read all the garbage papers out there. I have better time to spend than to just see th this rehashed template of a phylogenetic reconstruction that pretends to be science. It's not. It's not. And I, I did go through a lot more detail with the Topoi summaries to say, you know, I really mean business about this. You guys have to show um, the other side has to be has to come to terms with a lot more statistical considerations of the probability of some of these changes. You know, you're just glossing it over because you could put this stuff in. You can do a, a gather a whole bunch of sequences, throw them into a um, a sequence aligner, and then put it in a tree algorithm. It's going to build a nested hierarchy. I acknowledge that. That's easy. That proves that doesn't prove the feasibility of the transition. Certainly not the eukaryotic transition. And no biologist will say that that's a very highly likely transition. You just, you know, all that, all that phylogenetic tree does is show that you assume that if you assume that it happened by universal common ancestry, all that phylogenetic tree does is show that there are some proteins that, that may have carried over in the transition. It says nothing of all the other proteins that just had to suddenly appear like the important complex, et cetera, et cetera, and um, all, or, or all the other uh, organelles or parts of organelles that had to appear it says nothing of the probability of those. It's circular reasoning. It's not a mechanistic proof. And all, as far as I know, no biologist thinks the transition is trivial. We did a talk here on, on this channel on, uh, it was the paper, The Irreducible Nature of Eukaryotes. It's an old paper, but it was pretty devastating on all the difficulties that had had to be overcome. And we've had some other things. So now I am, you know, Dapper Dino is, or it was someone else on his channel. So I apologize in advance, Dapper, if I'm not characterizing this. They're saying, oh, Sal's just saying, you know, uh, he thinks he can refute evolution if you refute eukaryotic evolution. It's like, yeah, that's the base of the tree. You cut the base of the tree, the whole tree's gone. You have to assume independent ancestry at that point, which by the, the way, that is starting to be coming into vogue quietly, that instead of saying a single, instead of saying a single eukaryotic ancestor, they're speculating that not only Yuka, but the Luca, last universal common ancestor, but the ultimate ancestor was not never a single cell to begin with, but a population of cells, that's independent ancestry. So 
I pick out the butterfly, I think, I think they're underestimating just how difficult it is. And that's one reason I don't get along well with evolutionary biologists. They don't think mechanistically of the difficulties. They keep going back to their playbook of these phylogenetic reconstructions that are not mechanistic analyses. A mechanistic analysis is looking at the organs, systems, and the developmental pathways that have to be in place. And all the things that could go wrong if you're not lacking, if you're lacking certain parts. Um, phylogenetic reconstructions don't do this. And I, I'm going to make the same argument with zinc finger proteins. I see the same template being played out in the papers on zinc finger protein evolution. It's the same <clears throat> circular reasoning, and it's really disturbing. And, and so I'll report on this. So now my voice is getting harsh. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm actually almost done. I mentioned Brandolini's law. Again, it takes um, the, my family friendly version of Brandolini's law is that um, um, Brandolini's law is, it takes 40 times more effort to refute a falsehood than the state of falsehood in a short format. And that was it, that was really exemplified in this recent exchange between James Tour and quote unquote, fake professor Dave Farina, who gave 20 minutes of garbage uh, and he's not even a professor. And he was called out by a real professor, one of the top chemists in the world, as evidenced by the fact, as evidenced by the fact that he was summoned to the United States Congress to give testimony on advanced technologies, particularly regarding graphene chemistry. And this top chemist, took 10 hours and 15 episodes over the course of about a month, a month and a half to call out 20 minutes of garbage. So it's really easy to state garbage. It takes way more effort to clean it up. That is Brandolini's law. And that's one of the problems actually in cleaning up, first off, abiogenesis theory, and I'll say also evolutionary theory, because it's really easy to make these phylogenetic reconstructions it's really hard to dig up, like say the structure of just one protein. And in, the, in, the, and in my case, when I was making my argument, it was just one protein, it was topoisomerase. I had to learn, thankfully, I, I, work for, I have done work for a lab that studies the topoisomerase protein. I, I, I spent weeks studying, months studying the topoisomerase protein. I found the nuclear localization signal in an obscure paper. And then I pointed out the problem that took months. Some evolutionary biologists will go out there, just do a sequence analysis, you know, just do a se collect sequences. You can easily do it um, with the databases out there. Very easy to do. You could do it in a matter of minutes, actually. Uh, you could take the sequences, throw them in an alignment or, um, algorithm, and then pump out a tree. You could do this in less than an hour. It's that easy. Um, Erica and I, she was very, she was kind enough to invite me on her show, for which I'm eternally grateful. And I actually walked through the process. I said, this is how you're going to make a tree. And I was trying to teach creationists, first off, that you should respect that the nested hierarchy exists. And it's easy to build these trees. You, you can't, it's very hard not to have a tree when you're doing some of these. But what I was pointing out, it's very easy for Leophilius to just Google and not know what he's doing not knowing what he's looking for and say, hey, there's a paper that refutes you and, and it doesn't. It's also very easy, relatively speaking, to just take sequence alignments and say, hey, this, you know, this shows the evolution of topoisomerase. And you don't look at the mechanistic details as I was trying to outline in my talk on miracles of transitionals versus stairways to understanding. Because I had to explain why the absence of the nuclear localization signal is absolutely fatal and it won't evolve. Selection, furthermore, would select against its evolution. It doesn't help. Dr. Dan showed up on my channel when Dr. Change Tan and Dr. James Carter was here and he said, well, you know, that's kind of, you know, he said, okay, but I'm not interested if you can't put natural selection in your, into your calculations. I failed to point out then, I, I you know, I really, because I was running the controls, I didn't have time to respond. If I had had the time to respond, I would have told Dr. Dan the calculation would be even more unfavorable if 
we added natural selection because selection would prevent the evolution because you'd only have one shot to get it right um, when all the other machinery is there and the creature would die. You're not going to have, you're not going to have this incremental uh, stuff where, it, you know, you get a partial local, you know, an insufficient localization signal and, and, and it, you know, kind of halfway works. It's either dead or alive. It either is in the cytoplasm and moves to the nucleus or it doesn't. So um, that's my little thing on Brandolini's law. I have felt that evolutionary biology on the whole has been enforced with Brandolini's law, that they're able to state falsehoods that take way more time to clean up than it does to actually state it. And they, uh, the industry has persisted in their falsehoods because of that fact. It's actually made it easy for them to say things that are false and that are, uh, that are believable. But in the modern day, as we've had more data, the argument that I made on Topoi Samurai probably couldn't have been made, could not have been made 40 years ago, but it's doable now. Now in the era that we're learning way more about proteins and how they operate in the cell, there, you know, I can sense this quietly more and more people, they may be in the closet or simple design because they're seeing the complexity and that they're seeing these phylogenetic reconstructions are not real explanations for the complexity. Many of them would not be outright creationists, certainly not young earth creationists. Many of them would be more like Michael Behe, who would accept common ancestry and say, well, you know, maybe we can accept that these trees indicate universal common ancestry, but it doesn't indicate a mindless process because of the intricacy and the complexity. So let me acknowledge Gutsick. I'm glad that we've had uh, this chance to interact. And I am sad to say, I finally got my university privileges terminated. I no longer have access to papers. So if these papers are not available um, publicly, I'm gonna have to ask someone's grace to send them to me uh, because I no longer have academic access. It, it got like a, a couple months ago. Uh, but thank you very much. And maybe Emery will help me in this project. Um, and Gutsick is here. If you're interested, give him a look. I haven't read them yet, but I think the ones I can digest, the Truman papers, will be fun when I get the moment. And Erica, I, I, you know, this is kind of hard because Erica's a friend. We go back a long ways. And she was, it was just so much fun when she moderated our debate. We were uh, teasing her uh, that she'd recently gotten engaged. It was just such a happy moment. And, you know, when you, you build friendships with people, um, it, it's really kind of hard to, to be on opposite sides of a very hot button issue like creation evolution. We have agreed not to debate each other, and I don't plan to. Um, I, I would like, the, the, the other thing is that it's, it's very good that we can kind of keep this dialogue and I have someone on that we can still have a conversation and it actually does provide editorial review. So, um, and Emory, thank you also. So this is great. We have graduate student creationist in Emory, graduate student in Erica, and I consider myself graduate student too. And we're all talking and um, it, it's been a civil, civil dialogue. Um, <laughs> yes, you can take criticism. <laughs> uh, so some of the stuff you've taken, I don't think I would put up with, honestly. Um, and I'll be public. I don't think s some of it was really fair. Um, or I, I felt it was over the top and unnecessary. Um, you know, you could, you, you could say stuff without, um, people can criticize you without making all these cartoons and Kind of being mean spirited, I, you know. I don't. I try not to treat people um, in a way that I don't like to be treated. So um, anyway, thank you. I have. Uh, it's been great hanging out with you all. I'd like to thank all the viewers, and I'm definitely. <clears throat> I'm definitely not the sort that can talk very long. Um, you can probably hear my voice is breaking down. So thank you very much. It's been a joy talking about the Bible and scriptures. How. Atheism has no answers, but Christianity does. And the answers, uh, its answers 
are meaningful to the extent that they are true. And that's why we study evidences and reasons for the Christian faith. For those of you that have uh, experienced God's power in your life, either through miracles or um, in your in your own life or the lives of those you love, um, you understand what I'm saying. I don't have to. I don't have to explain more. Uh, for the doubting Thomases, I'm right there with you. I've been there. This channel is organized to help individuals like yourself, and it's been a it's been a privilege to be of service to you. Uh, in these difficult times. And it's just, I can't tell you how much comfort it is to be around you all. Um, during this time in my life, it's a little difficult. Many of you know that mom's ill. And um, I can't tell you how much, uh, how comforting it is to have um, your support and, and appreciation. And uh, it motivates me to also do, try to do my best to do a good job for you all on this channel. So take care and God bless you and have a great evening. Good night.